All right. So we're going to um, go ahead and talk about the different types of isomers that we actually might encounter in organic chemistry. Okay, so what we're talking about is different types of related compounds, but they typically are not going to be the same molecule. Okay, so it's kind of things we're going to look out for. But before we get into isomers, uh, we're going to first discuss what are not isomers, right? So two compounds which we would not consider to be isomers. Okay, and so really what we're looking at with not isomers is somehow completely different molecules. So these could have different atoms in them. So for instance, uh, the molecule on the left that just popped up uh, which has an alcohol group uh, in the two position, whereas the one on the right has a chlorine, they're different atoms. That would definitely make them not isomers. Okay, all the compounds, you know, may have the same atoms in them, but they're gonna have a different molecular formula, right? So if we look at the molecule on the left there, that's cyclobutane, okay? That would have a formula of uh, C4, four carbons, and each carbon has a CH2 group, so it's C4HH. The one on the right, which is N-butane, still has four carbons, so that part is the same, but the terminal groups have CH3 groups on them, right? So we have, two pairs of two carbons from the middle and two pairs of three carbons from the end, overall butane would have a formula of C4H10, right? And C4H10 would have a different formula to uh, C4H8, okay? So those are compounds that are not isomers. They're completely different molecules. We can't find a lot of relationships between them, okay? So the next and most sort of broad class of isomers are what are called constitutional isomers. Okay, so these are compounds, right, where we have the same molecular formula, okay, but different connectivity structures and functionality. Okay, so we're going to have the same formula. So if it's C4, H8, all of them, different types of constitutional isomers are going to have the formula C4, H8. But there's going to be some difference in how the groups are connected, the structures, and potentially even the functionality and reactivity, right? So, for instance, the two that we've shown here uh, both have the same formula, okay? It's still four carbons. All of them have 10 hydrogens and one oxygen, right? But the place in which we've connected the OH group is different in the molecule on the left here. Okay, we've got the OH group on the two carbon and on the one on the right, it would be on the one carbon, right? So one would be um, two butanol and the other one would be one butanol. And those are different molecules They differ in how the groups are connected. If we go down the chain and we ask the atoms, what are they connected to? We're going to get a different response, right? On the second carbon, the molecule on the left, it's going to say it's connected to two carbons, one hydrogen, one oxygen. Whereas on the molecule on the right, it's going to say two carbons, two hydrogens. The one carbon is going to say um, three hydrogens, one carbon for the molecule on the left. And on the one on the right, it's going to say um, one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen, right? So the connectivity is different. Um, similarly, we might have the same molecular formula, right? Both the molecules shown are C4H8, right? So cyclobutane and 2-butene are both, um, both have this formula C4H8, for four carbons, eight hydrogens, but the functionality is different, right? One is a cycloalkane, the other one is an alkene, it has a pi bond, right? And the reactivity of what you can do with an alkene is very different to what you can do with just an alkene, right? So constitutional isomers have the same molecular formula, but not a lot of similarity beyond that, okay? So the functionality, the connectivity, and the structures are going to be different between two different types of constitutional isomers. Where it gets a bit more interesting is when we're talking about stereoisomers. Okay, so the other types of isomers are all different types of stereoisomers. So we can sort of represent this in this big purple triangle, right? So we sort of have the black, 
segment, which is all the molecules that are not isomers. We have the green description, which is all the different types of constitutional isomers. And then every other type of isomer is going to be a stereoisomer, okay? These are compounds that have the same connectivity, meaning if we go along the molecule and ask every atom what it's connected to, the response would actually be the same. So there's different geometries, right? There's different configurations. That's the key thing. And so there's two distinct types of stereoisomers. Okay, one of them has a very strict definition, right? Which is enantiomers. So if we look at enantiomers, okay, enantiomers are defined as having non-superimposable mirror images meaning we have two molecules which are mirror images of each other but those two mirror images are not superimposable okay so there's different examples that we can think of that for instance like shown here the um, two butanol molecules here <clears throat> are both mirror images of each other okay they're perfect mirror images of each other but we can convince ourselves that those two are non-superimposable there's no way we can get the top version of um, 2-butanol onto the bottom version of 2-butanol without breaking and reforming bonds, right? That's the key thing about stereoisomers. In order to make the two molecules superimposable, we're going to need to break and reassemble bonds to make the other molecule. So in antimers, we're talking about non-superimposable mirror images. The key thing is the two molecules must be mirror images of each other to be in antimers couple of other examples, right? We can have um, these two alkyl halides, okay? They're also mirror images of each other to non-superimposable. Notice we can represent um, it either by drawing the mirror image like we've shown uh, up here on the sort of top right, or we can use the wedges and dashes and that also can tell us that we have mirror images of each other. We can also go ahead and use our RS type um, naming to actually convince ourselves whether two molecules are enantiomers or not. Key thing is two compounds are mirror images of each other that are not superimposable. Okay. And when we have multiple chiral centers in the molecule, okay, for a molecule to be an enantiomer, right, every chiral center needs to be flipped here, right? So our two structures shown here are enantiomers because we flipped the configuration of the OH from dashed on the left to wedged OH on the right. We've also flipped the configuration of the fluorine from being dashed on the um, left to wedged on the, on the right. Remembering that wedges indicate bonds that are coming at us and dashes are bonds that are going away from us, right? But in all these cases here, they're perfect mirror images. The whole molecule is a mirror image of the other one. And those two have to be non-superimposable. And the non-superimposable is a big part of it. Every molecule has a mirror image, just like everything else on Earth, I guess except for vampires, have mirror images. Okay, so the key thing is everything that's, you know, a real molecule or a real object has a mirror image. It's just that the mirror image may or may not be superimposable. If we're talking about two molecules that are perfect mirror images, but not superimposable, in that case there, we're talking about two enantiomers. Comparing that to say our cyclobutane molecule, right? It does have a mirror image, but the mirror image is also cyclobutane. So in that case there, the, super, the mirror images would be superimposable. So cyclobutane would not be a molecule that has an enantiomer. We have two molecules, mirror images, not superimposable, then we have enantiomers. Now the other types of stereoisomers or different geometric isomers are what are called disteriomers, right? And there's a sort of binary split. All stereoisomers are either enantiomers or disteriomers. And if they don't satisfy the strict definition of an enantiomer being two molecules that are mirror images, not superimposable. In that case there, they fall into the other category, which is the diastereomers, right? So we sort of represented enantiomers in blue, 
within the sort of purple stereoisomer triangle. If it's not in the blue triangle of enantiomers, it will automatically fall into the red triangle of diastereomers, assuming our two molecules are in fact stereoisomers of each other or geometric isomers of each other. So diastereomers are simply all other types of stereoisomers that are not enantiomers, right? So if it's stereo, two molecules are stereoisomers of each other, but not enantiomers, they automatically become diastereomers. And we can go through several examples of this, right? We can go through, say, EZ uh, type isomers or cis trans type isomers. Those would typically fall into the diastereomer type category. Um, you know, cis trans in rings, okay? In this case here, we definitely have geometric isomers. We can't superimpose the two molecules on top of each other, but then um, actually both achiral molecules. So they're definitely not in the enantiomer category. So instead they fall into the diastereomer category. And when we have molecules with multiple uh, chiral centers, if we go ahead and just flip some of those chiral centers, but not every single one of them, we end up with a pair of diastereomers, right? So back here on sort of our um, three fluoro um, two butanol molecules, if we've just flipped the OH bond, but not the CF bond, right? Those two molecules are no longer perfect mirror images of each other. Part of it is a mirror image, but not the whole molecule. That still falls under diastereomers, right? We have to be like we were way down on the bottom uh, right, where we flipped both the configuration of the OH group and the uh, fluorine group, right? We flipped both of them from wedge to both of them to dash, or both of them from dash to both of them to wedge. In that case, we make a perfect mirror image, we end up with enantiomers. If we just flip part of it, we end up with diastereomers. So hopefully you sort of found this uh, little you know, chart or Venn diagram for different types of isomers. Okay, so constitutional isomers, stereoisomers, and then sort of breaking up all stereoisomers into two groups, either enantiomers with a very strict definition, or diastereomers, which is the catch-all for all others. So hopefully this was useful to you, and thanks so much.